Well, good morning and welcome to our Bible study. This is Calvary Baptist Church in Delta, Ohio. It's Thursday morning, April the 9th. Um, my intention is to do this on Wednesdays and we will proceed with doing that come next week. But um, <clears throat> let's get right into our study. And um, I'd like for you to take the word of God and turn with me to the Gospel of John. And we're going to look at John chapter number 2 today. John chapter number two. A wonderful book, a tremendous book is the Gospel of John. Uh, John, of course, is the human writer. Um, he wrote this Gospel, and uh, he wrote also 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then again, the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. And John um, sets forth to show us the deity of Christ, <clears throat> one of his favorite titles. For the Lord is the Son of God. And um, that's what we'll see as we look at, um, as we study through the Gospel of John. But we'll pray together and we'll ask God's blessing upon his word. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for this time to study the word of God. And uh, thank you, Lord, for the Gospel of John. Um, what, a, what a great book. Um, and we see our Lord's deity and we see his great love for us here Pray, God, as we look in John chapter number two, we pray that you would bless the word of God, speak to our hearts, use it in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week in John chapter number one, and John chapter number one is a longer chapter, there's 51 verses, we saw at the beginning of it how uh, John presents um, to us uh, Jesus, the word of God. Um, in the beginning was the Word, and I just want to review a little bit. And uh, the Word, of course, is Logos, meaning um, the eternal Word. Jesus is the eternal Word of God. And when we talk about um, His eternality, it's, it's a, just an incredible thing to consider um, our Lord's eternal nature. And um, there never was a time when He began um, he is from everlasting to everlasting. And he is, as the writer of Hebrews says, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And um, in the fullness of the time, in the fullness of the time, he took upon himself human flesh and became man without ever ceasing to be God. Just some things to consider. And we also saw in John chapter number one that the Lord is the creator of all things. It told us in verse number, uh, tells us in verse number three, all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. So he is the divine creator. He has created everything. And this of course just um, shows forth to us the folly of evolution. Uh, man has not evolved. Um, God is the creator of all things. Um, in fact, man himself is the crowning point of God's creation and made in the likeness of God. Uh, that's what man is, made in his moral likeness. He has a spirit, a soul, and a body. Um, just a couple of things to look at here. So as we looked at John chapter number one, we saw how Christ called his first disciples and they began to follow him. Now we come into John chapter number two, and this is the beginning of the Lord's earthly ministry here. And his public ministry begins at a wedding in Cana. And, um, you know, if, I think we understand what had happened there. Uh, there was a great need at this particular wedding feast uh, his mother was there, Jesus was called, the disciples were called, and while this, was, while this wedding was going on, this feast, there was a problem. They had run out of wine, and that was a very serious problem in those days. And uh, Jesus performed a miracle here, he turned the water into wine. And this is the first um, miracle of the Lord, the first sign. I think it's very interesting because I want to point out something here that 
Uh, John records for us, John does, records for us the Lord's first miracle and his last miracle. In John chapter 1, he records for us um, the Lord turning the water into wine. And in John chapter 11, he records for us um, the Lord raising Lazarus from the dead. Now, when we come to John chapter number 12, to the end of the book, it deals with the last week in the life of Christ. John chapter 14, 15, and 16 um, is the upper room discourse. Then we follow him into um, the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, where he is betrayed. Um, then we see his um, standing before Pilate, uh, standing before Caiaphas, uh, then ultimately going to the cross where he is crucified, his subsequent burial and resurrection. Then at the conclusion of that book, he shows himself on the shore to the disciples. But um, those, those two miracles, the first and last miracle, John records for us in this gospel. The first one is at a wedding. The second one, or I'm sorry, the last one is at a funeral. Now, now you think about that, okay? The first one is at a wedding. You know, a wedding is often one of life's um, happiest times. Yeah, there's often great joy at a wedding, and Jesus was there. He, he was there. In John chapter 11, we find him raising Lazarus from the dead. He's at a funeral, and a funeral is really life's saddest moments, right? It's one of the saddest periods of time. And so you go from, you know, the gladdest um, moments in time from a wedding to the saddest moment in time at a funeral and Jesus as, is at both of them. And he does the miraculous. He, of course, he raised Lazarus from the dead. But you think about all of that, okay? Um, he, he, he's experienced everything in life that we have. The joy of a wedding and the sorrow of a funeral and everything in between. And now that he has passed into the heavens and is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, he has now become a sympathetic high priest for us. Uh, one who is not untouched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And therefore, you know, he is able to secour us. That's the word the Bible used. It means he is able to help us in the time of need. I mean, he, he truly is the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And I think that's something that we need to consider, okay? Because we're going to see him here at uh, one of life's happiest moments at a wedding. Now consider this also, and I think this is interesting to point out as well. <clears throat> now remember this, that the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, the law cannot save. In fact, the law kills. The law kills. Um, grace is what makes us alive. When a person believes on Christ, it is by grace through faith that ye are saved, okay? When we consider, for example, <clears throat> Moses, the first miracle that Moses did was to turn the water into blood in Egypt, in Egypt. That was the first miracle, something miraculous there. And that was a picture of death. Moses represents the law, okay? And the law kills. And so the, the water being turned into blood is a picture of death. Here we see water being turned into wine, which is a picture of new life. So as the law kills, Christ gives life. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So I think that uh, that's something just to, you know, keep in our minds as, as, we, as we look at all of this here. All right, so as we look at John chapter number two, there's three um, 
interesting um, events that are taking place here. So let's notice in verses 1 through 11, the sign at Cana. In other words, the miracle at Cana. And in verses 1 and 2, there's a marriage here. There's the marriage at Cana. So let's look at verses 1 and 2. It tells us, And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. So there's a marriage here at Cana. Now, it tells us the third day. Well, the third day after what? Well, the third day after what we see in chapter 1 and verse number 43. In chapter 1 and verse 43, we see the day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. Okay? The third day from when he called his disciples, specifically with the beginning of calling Philip to follow him. So this is the third day from that time. But there's also something I think that's very important to point out because the third day is resurrection truth. Because the Lord Jesus was raised the third day, on the third day according to the scriptures. You see, um, this is all about Christ. It's all about the Lord himself. And, and every expression, every phrase, every word, of course, every jot and tittle okay, is given by inspiration of God. So when the Holy Spirit puts the third day here, okay, he's pointing out to the fact that this third day began after Jesus, or this third day was after Jesus began to call his disciples. But there's also a resurrection truth because Jesus was raised the third day. And uh, notice in verse number two, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. So Jesus is at this wedding. And um, th th there's no doubt that the Lord uh, sanctifies the institution of marriage and he does so both by his presence and his blessing. Um, God has given us the institution of marriage. Uh, the first marriage was in Eden uh, between a man and a woman, uh, between Adam and Eve. And that is the only kind of marriage that God uh, sanctifies. That's the only kind of marriage that God recognizes. So here the Lord Jesus is in the, is, he's right here in the midst and he sanctions it, okay? And he sanctions it with his presence and his blessing. <clears throat> then we see in verses three through five, the mother of our Lord, which is, which is Mary. Now, notice what she suggests, okay? Um, they, they had run out of wine, and the custom in those days is that um, all of those who attended a wedding feast, well, all of, you know, everything that they needed to take care of their guests, all their needs were supposed to be met, and the running out of this, uh, running out of the wine was a serious matter here. And uh, notice in verse number three, we read this. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Now let's just pause and think about something here. Uh, Mary is speaking to Jesus, her son. And going back to the time of her visit by the angel Gabriel, uh, she had been told that the child that she was going to bear uh, would indeed be the Son of God. Okay? And she gave birth to the Lord Jesus. And of course, her conception was miraculous. She was the only parent. The Holy Spirit overshadowed her, and Jesus was born. Um, and for the next 30 years, because Again, this is the beginning of the Lord's public ministry, okay, right here in Galilee. She knew 
uh, the supernatural nature of her son. She knew who her son indeed was. And so she comes to him with this suggestion. Can you imagine all of the things that she must have pondered in her heart through the years, um, being, being the mother of Jesus here? And so they had run out of wine. Now there's something with that as well. Now they're at a Jewish feast. Okay? And um, there, there is more to it than just the, run, the wine running out. This was something that was, you know, paramount in a Jewish feast. There had to be wine for the guests along with food and so forth, but the wine was something of the utmost importance. Well, the running out of wine, I believe, shows to us the failure of Judaism. The Judaism was the religious system of the day. And Judaism was a system that was made by man. It was man-made works. In fact, what it was, it, it perverted the law. It was very grievous. It was very burdensome. Um, and no one could be saved through this religious system of Judaism. Just like today, nobody can be saved by works. Nobody can be saved through a religious system. Nobody can be saved. The baptismal tank is behind me. Nobody can be saved by baptism. One must be born again. One must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the wine ran out. And, and here you have the very, very Son of God who in Him is life. In, in Him is light right there. So the wine running out um, shows us that you know, man-made religion cannot satisfy the spiritual needs of people. Um, it also, it also uh, shows us, it also shows us um, just how hard that Judaism was. Trying to keep the law in order to be saved is an impossibility here. So there's the failure of the wine. Then notice in verse number four, what Jesus and how he responds to her. Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet to come. Now the word woman is a term of respect, a term of endearment. Um, Jesus placed a very high regard and honor upon women, certainly upon his mother, Mary. Um, there were, there were, women that ministered to Jesus during his earthly ministry. Um, they were there at the tomb on the resurrection morning. And so this word woman um, is a term of endearment. And he says, he says to her, mine hour is not yet to come. Uh, uh, mine hour is not yet come. And the hour that he is speaking of here um, is the hour of the cross, the hour of his passion, the hour when he would go to Calvary and bleed and die, which is why he came into this world. He came, you know, not to give a better way of life. He didn't come to be, um, you know, a great example. He came to offer himself a sacrifice for our sins. And where we are today is Thursday, and we are approaching Resurrection Sunday. And it was in this time, these three days leading up to Sunday, that the hour had come for him. That's why he came. For this purpose came I forth. And so the hour means the cross, where Jesus would go and where he would voluntarily lay down his life and give himself as a sacrifice for our sins. Notice Mary's submission now in verse number five here. And um, he, she says, Jesus saith unto her in verse number four, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And notice, notice her submission in verse five. His mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. So the servants, Jesus was going to tell the servants to 
fill those water pots, there's six of them, fill those water pots to the brim, and then he would perform the miraculous. He would change the water into wine. But these seven words are, are really words of the greatest advice that can ever be given. She says, whatsoever he, meaning Jesus, saith unto you, do it. That's great advice. You can't top that advice. Whatever, whatever the Lord says we're to do, we're to obey him, and we obey him by faith. You see, obedience to God through his word is the way to his blessing. And so whatever the Lord has called you to do and whatever the Lord has spoken you to you to do, then just do it. Then just do it because it's the way of blessing. Now in verse number six, let's notice these containers, these water pots here. It says, and there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece, six stone water pots. Okay? Now, they contain probably somewhere about 25 gallons, I would guess, each. So, you know, not too large, not too small, but 25 gallons approximately, but there's six of them. There's six of them. Again, every phrase, okay, and every word in the Bible is given by inspiration of God. Six is the number of man. Six is one short of perfection. They are water pots of stone. There is no life in stone, in a stone. It's a, it's a dead thing. It's an inanimate thing here. There's that, again, there's the deadness of Judaism here. There's the deadness of religious works. There's also the deadness of a man's spirit. A okay? man has a spirit, right? Man has a spirit. Right? God has created a spirit, soul, and body. And But apart from the regenerating work of God by his Holy Spirit, okay, man is dead in sin. He is spiritually dead. Uh, the Bible bears this out in Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened which were dead in trespasses and in sin. So man, apart from salvation, is, is dead in sin. And we notice the command that's given in verses 7 and 8. And Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they fill them to the brim. And he saith unto them, uh, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. Now you see, they're obeying the Lord. Okay, these servants were obeying the Lord, and because they obeyed him, he was going to do something miraculous. Look at verses 9 and 10. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. And so this is the very first miracle that Jesus performed in turning the water into wine. But this changing, this transformation, a transformation happened, just like a transformation happens when a person is saved. Okay, so before salvation, a person is dead in sin. After they've believed on Christ, after they, they've trusted Christ, and faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, after, you know, that happens, this transformation happens. Uh, you know, takes place and they become a new creature in Christ. So you go from something, you know, from, how can I put it, uh, something organic to inorganic. The water, something natural to something supernatural. Uh, just like, just like when, when a person who is dead in sin has believed on Christ, 
he, he has passed from death unto life. So in other words, there's a picture of the new birth here. And that's something that Jesus had talked about to Nicodemus when we get into chapter number three. Uh, Jesus spoke to Nicodemus and said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, ye must be born again. And there Jesus is speaking about the spiritual birth. Nicodemus, being a Pharisee, was just concentrating and focused on the physical. But Jesus wasn't speaking about the physical. He was speaking about the spiritual. He came to give life. Okay, He came to give life. And then the result of it is in verse number 11 where he manifested forth his glory. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. Then notice, and his disciples believed on him. Now that's a key expression. The disciples believed on him. They believed on Christ. And um, the gospel writers, Matthew and Mark, often write about believing on the Lord. So there's the sign at Cana in verse 11. And notice with me um, a second event. We see Jesus at Capernaum in verse number 12. Now we read in verse number 12, after this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. So Christ now abode at Capernaum, and which is where uh, after he left Galilee is where he had established his uh, ministry headquarters, if you would. Uh, but notice that um, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren. Now his brethren, of course, were born after him. And um, this shows us, you know, that, that Mary did not remain a perpetual virgin. Okay? Jesus had brethren. She gave birth to other children. And then he continued there not many days. So that's really what verse number 12. Now we, we pick this up in verses 13 through 25. And Jesus comes to Jerusalem and he, and he purges, he cleanses the temple. And um, there's two instances of the Lord cleansing the temple. One at the beginning of his ministry and the second one nearing the ending of his ministry. And in verses 13 through 22, we see how the temple is cleansed. And let's look at uh, verses 13 down through 16, okay? So it tells us, and the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Well, this was the first of three Passovers um, that, that would be observed, okay, uh, by the Lord. The Passover was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. It's very interesting as we look in the Word of God, we, we find we're always going up to Jerusalem for it is the city of the king. And in verse 14, down through verse 16, we see the purging of the temple. It says, and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables, and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. So the Lord Jesus here, he scourges the temple here. And again, uh, this is uh, the first time where he went into the temple to cleanse it. The second time was nearing the end of his, of his earthly ministry. 
Now, there's a cross-reference that I'm going to read, and it's found in Malachi uh, chapter number 3. Malachi chapter number 3. Malachi, Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. But in Malachi chapter number 3, um, let's take a look here at verses 1 through 3. Malachi 3 verses 1 through 3. We read in verse 1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And that was John the Baptist. And the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple. And so, you know, after, after his stay at Capernaum, Jesus goes up to Jerusalem, and he's suddenly there just as Malachi had prophesied, even the messenger of the covenant, which is the Lord, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who will stand before he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So that's quite a prophecy that Malachi presents to us. Okay? The Lord Jesus has come to the temple. And when he comes into the temple, he sees the commercialism going on. He sees the covetousness that's, <clears throat> that's, uh, that's taking place. And he clears it out. He purges it. Why? Because it's his father's house. And his father's house is to be a house that's pure, a, a house of honor, a house of worship, a house of praise. And what you see here is the Lord's righteous anger on display. And the Lord is righteously angry against sin. And so we see that taking place here. Then we come to verse number 17, back in John chapter number 2, and we see how the scriptures are remembered because there's a reference here to Psalm 69 in verse number 9 in verse 17. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Now that's a direct reference to Psalm 69 in verse number 9. So we see how the scriptures are about the Lord Jesus Christ here. Then we come to verses 18 through 22, and, and we see the resurrection of the Lord's temple here. Okay? Now, there's a sign requested in verse number 18. Now, he has cleared out the temple. Okay? He has cleared out the temple just as Malachi had prophesied he would. And um, the, the, the people of his day, the Judaizers, you know, they failed to believe on him. They knew who he was, but they rejected him. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And they request a sign in verse number 18. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things. They were seeking a sign. And then notice, notice what, uh, what, how he responds, beginning in verse number 19. Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So the Jews were requesting a sign. They were looking for a sign. Oh, and Jesus said, destroy this temple in verse number 19, and in three days I will raise it up. But they were they were believing that the temple that he was talking about was the physical building. He wasn't talking about the physical building. He was talking about himself. He was talking about his body. 
And that's the sign that they needed to believe on. Okay? They needed to believe on him because of the fact that he would be raised from the dead. Now, the temple is his body. Jesus would be crucified. He would die on the cross. And John records for us the fact that Jesus truly died. He died on the cross. A Roman soldier came with a spear and he plunged it into the side of Jesus, piercing his heart, and forthwith came blood and water. Okay? Jesus had died on the cross. And they took him down from the cross, they buried him in Joseph's tomb, and the third day he arose. Jesus actually died on the cross. He did not swoon. He was not resuscitated. He did not revive in the coolness of the tomb. No, he was dead. But he was raised by his own power. He was raised by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was raised by God the Father, okay, on the third day. And Jesus, and, and that's literal, okay? That's his literal bodily resurrection. And his bodily resurrection shows us that he paid the penalty for our sin, that our sins are buried, okay? And by coming up from the, the, the dead on the third day, it proved his power over death, his power over Satan. Um, he defeated it for us, okay? And he came, he, he arose the third day. And Jesus said he would be in the heart of the earth just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. And, you know, Jonah was spit out on dry land. Uh, but Jesus was raised from the dead. And he said, I will raise it up. Now, that's, you know, that's resurrection truth. And because, because you know, Jesus is alive, we that know him um, are alive. And because Jesus has has been resurrected, that guarantees also our resurrection. Because one day, we're going to be raised. And um, there, that day is still future, but it is, but it is coming. So Jesus wasn't talking about the temple where he had just cleansed and purged it. He's talking about his body, the temple of his body. As a side note to all of that, as believers, our bodies are temples. They're the temples of the Holy Ghost. The Apostle Paul tells us what? Know ye not, you know, that uh, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which ye have of God and ye are not of your own. So our bodies are also temples um, by which the Holy Spirit indwells us. Now in verse 22, we see his disciples and um, or in verse 22, and therefore he was risen. So John was already pointing to resurrection truth here before it had happened. When he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Remember the greatest advice that Mary gave to the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Okay. Well, we're to believe what God has said in his word and we're to obey it and we're to act upon it. Verse 23, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, notice many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Now, you know, prior to this, his disciples believed on him. Now, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Okay. Uh, we're to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is to be the object of our faith. And uh, they believed in him because they saw the miracles that he was doing. Okay. And in verse number 24, the result of all of that is this, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men 
and needed not that any should testify of him, for he knew what was in man. Again, the deity of Christ, the omniscience of Christ. He knows all men. He knows what's inside of men. He did not commit himself. He did not trust himself to all men because some were merely professors and not possessors. They were believing because of the miracles that he did rather than believing the fact that he is Christ the Savior or believing the fact that he had to go to the cross to pay for the penalty of sin. And so these verses tell us that our Lord knows the hearts of all. He knows the hearts of all men. So John chapter number two, John chapter number two begins with a marriage at Cana, the first miracle that Jesus performed. And we see some of the implications of that miracle and the picture there of the deadness of Judaism, the turning of the water into wine, showing forth the miraculous or the miracle of the new birth. Our Lord's sojourning at Capernaum, where he had established his earthly headquarters and his scourging of the temple at Jerusalem. And Lord willing, next week, next Wednesday, we will look at John chapter number three, all right? Our Father, we thank you for the word of God. God, help us to keep it near and dear to our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.